wonderful to have the light of God's word. We, we have mentioned, I think before about John Fawcett, the hymn writer wrote, blessed be the tie that binds. Uh, when uh, he got saved under the ministry of George Whitfield there in England, he had an instant desire to learn the word of God. His father had apprenticed him to a neighbor and the neighbor worked John uh, really hard. So when John got paid, he went to town. The first thing that he bought was a Bible. Didn't have a Bible and he wanted to know God's word. And he bought a candle and he took that back with him. Uh, during the night, uh, be before he went to sleep, he would tie his, a rope around his arm, tie it to the bedpost. And when he would turn during the night, it would wake him. Then he'd get up, get out of bed, light the candle and read God's word. And that's how that great preacher uh, learn the Word of God. Similar to that, the story of Andrew Broadus, great Baptist preacher, hymn writer in Virginia. He had nine months of official education, just nine months. He had to labor on the farm with his dad. He didn't have any textbooks, but he had a Bible. And at night, he would lie on the floor and he'd take a pine knot now, some of you older ones will understand what I'm talking about. He'd take a pine knot and he would light that and it would burn. It'd give him light enough to study the Bible. We have all kinds of Bibles, all kinds of resources. Uh, we have electricity. I think most of us would have electricity in our homes. And uh, yet we sometimes don't put forth enough effort to learn the Word of God. But it's always a blessing when we get something from Scripture. And working for it really makes it even more special, I think. But the, the Bible is good. And we'll use Luke 6, verse 38 as the starting place for us this afternoon. And we're going to give you Baptist history. Luke 6 and verse 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Lord, thank you for the good time we've had in your name today. Lord, we've enjoyed good services. We've enjoyed good singing. We've enjoyed good food and good fellowship. And we ask now, Lord, that you would help us uh, to enjoy being together as we hear about one of your servants in Baptist history. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to talk to you this afternoon about Luther Rice. Luther Rice, one of the great names in Baptist history. He labored in nearly every state in the Union during his days. Born March 25th, 1783 in Northboro, Massachusetts. Rice was converted at the age of 19. He describes his conversion as much weeping and wailing. He grew up in a religious home, so his father didn't understand this idea of being converted. His father thought it was merely enough to be sincere and to be moral. But you know that's not enough as far as salvation is concerned. It won't get you into heaven. If you don't get saved, it'll land you in the lake of fire. Rice believed on the Lord. He then went to a college in Williams College, Williamstown, Massachusetts. He went in search of the truth. He's training for the ministry. And he said, let us love the truth. And whenever we have a call to defend it, let us endeavor to manifest that we love it and contend, not for victory, but for the truth's sake. And that's what we ought always to do, contend for the truth's sake. He entered Williams College in October 1807. And there... He became part of what is known as the Haystack Revival, a group of young people who had consecrated their lives to the Lord's service, met outdoors, and they met to pray when a storm arose. And several of them, Luther Rice included, took shelter under a local haystack or a nearby haystack. And while they were there under the haystack, the storm was raging and they're praying. Lord, would you use us? Lord, would you help us to serve you? Lord, would you help us to be more like you? And I think that we have stopped by that on at least one of our 
youth trips there in Williamstown, there is a monument, the Haystack Monument, that's erected to uh, commemorate that event. And it talks about that as being the birthplace of American missions. The reason is because of Luther Rice. Luther Rice continued to serve the Lord the whole time he was there at Williams College. He even began to raise money. And uh, that was sort of, I guess, a foretelling of what he would give his life to. But he raised money to send for the cause of missions. Then, after leaving Williams College, he went to Andover, Massachusetts. And there he enrolled in the Andover Seminary furthering his training for the ministry. While there, he met his lifelong friend, Adoniram Judson. Judson had made his way there also, and they, along with about three or four others, would go daily into the woods there behind the campus, and they would pray. It's known today, that site, as Missionary Rock, and we have been. Uh, to uh, that location. A uh, hundred years after those men consecrated their lives to missions, uh, there was by the American Board of Foreign Missions a plaque uh, placed on that rock, missionary rock, designating the place. Adoniram Judson said later, now he was in Burma for many years when he made this comment that no place and no time shaped his ministry more than being in the woods behind the seminary there in Andover because that's where he prayed. It's where he prayed with his brethren that God would use them in the cause of missions. Rice said, I have deliberately made up my mind to preach the gospel to the heathen and I do not know but that it may be in Asia. He was going to go as a missionary. His intended at that time, his fiance, when Rice let her know that he was going to be a missionary, she said, I will not be a missionary, and she left him. Rice never married. He literally gave himself to the cause of missions. They thought since missions was a new thing in America, remember in England, William Carey, the Baptist work there, he's on the field in India. Judson and the others want to join him there on the mission field. And they petitioned the Congregationalist to raise support for them to go to the mission field. It's brand new. The Congregationalists agreed, but the young men among themselves said, perhaps we'd better not present all of our names at the moment because it could overwhelm them and they might deny us all. So only four of us will present our names as candidates to go to the mission field, the Congregationalists agreed and they did form the American Board of Foreign Missions. They agreed to pay uh, passage for those men to go to the mission field and uh, support to keep them there. But Luther Rice, whose idea it was, who had prayed for it longest, was excluded. He was not one of the four, but he still determined to go. As time got nearer and there was gonna, they were going to have the, uh, the ordination of those missionaries and the commissioning service to send them to the foreign field, Luther Rice went just one week ahead of time and said, I must go to the mission field. His heart was burning to go and preach the gospel to the people on a foreign land. He said, I must go. Won't you send me as well? They agreed under one condition. They said, you must pay your own way. He's got a week to get all of his affairs in order. It takes him most of that week to do that, to get approval, to go. And then he's got two days to raise his passage. Two days. How does he do it? Well, we'd like to say he dropped to his knees and prayed and the Lord sent a door, uh, knock at the door in the middle of the night and someone handed him the money. That's not how it happened. You know how serious he was about going? He begged. He begged his passage. He went to businessmen. He went to Christian people. And he begged that they would give him money so that he could go to the mission field and preach the gospel. 
and he raised the money by begging. You say, well, I don't know if that's the way to do it. Well, mission, a lot of missionaries still have to do that. Thank the Lord you support missions. And people can come here and they can present their burden, but they don't have to beg because you have a heart for missions. Keep in mind that was a new thing as far as organized missions is concerned. Luther Rice was serious about going to the mission field and so he was able to go. He sailed the end of February, 1812, and he wrote these words in his journal, with pleasure, I leave America in hopes of preaching the gospel to the heathen, with pleasure. And folks, keep in mind, any time that we get to serve God, we don't have to, we get to. And any time we get to serve him, it ought to be a pleasure. Yes, there will be hardships. Yes, there will be setbacks. But it still ought to be a pleasure to serve the Lord. And I think I'm talking to people who determined many years ago that whatever happened to you, you'd serve the Lord faithfully and you'd do so with pleasure. And that's good. It's the right thing. Luther Rice, and we've talked about Rice and Judson selling aboard different ships making it there to India, aboard those ships. They are examining the scripture. They know they're going to meet with William Carey, William Ward, and Joshua Marshman, the Serampore Three, the Baptist who are there in India, and they're going to have to give an account of what they believe concerning baptism. Both of them, Judson and Rice, reach the same conclusion that the Baptists are right, and we're wrong. They are practicing believers' baptism by immersion, and that's the way they did it in the early church, and that's what we're going to have to do. And so when they got there to India, they made their change of sentiment known. Not instantly, but eventually. Ann Judson writes to her family, and she writes about that time. She said that... Adoniram had examined the Old Testament concerning the issue of baptism and its relation to circumcision and found that there was none. He also examined history books. She said, I have been examining the New Testament. And she's writing to her family and said, Dear family, we have made the decision to become Baptist. Not because we wish to but because truth compelled us to be. And uh, that's a good way to always embrace anything that we embrace, only if the Word of God teaches it. And so uh, Luther Rice, uh, he, after the Judsons made known their change, he makes known his change in sentiment and is baptized November the 1st, 1812, by William Ward. Now remember that this is 1812, after they sailed from England and before they arrived in India. What war breaks out? War of 1812. We're talking about our independence from Great Britain. We will celebrate that uh, this week, but it wouldn't be very long afterwards until war would break out again and uh, the United States would declare war on England this time. And uh, it would involve a, a lot of naval battles. Uh, we sang the Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem. I know that some of you have been to Fort McHenry and that fort that juts out into uh, the bay there and how that it was surrounded by the British Navy. And uh, they bombarded the fort all night long and in the morning, not just by the rocket's red glare, but in the morning when dawn breaks, there's the flag still standing. And it's very moving if you understand the history. And you know the reason why the world doesn't want to sing the other verses of the Star Spangled Banner. It talks about God, the heaven protected land. 
And don't let, don't let the modern educators and news media and government tell you, and even some preachers, that our forefathers were a bunch of deist and atheist and agnostic. That's a lie. It's a lie. Uh, to a man, almost every one of them were professing Christians. Uh, even Benjamin Franklin. Uh, you get the official biography of Franklin's life written by Jeremiah Chaplin, the Baptist preacher, who, by the way, is buried at Hamilton, and uh, he will give you uh, the information that you need, even to defend O Ben. And uh, we had uh, good founding fathers. Were they perfect men? No, neither any of us, but they believed in God, and uh, that's a blessing. War of 1812. That's going to change things for Judson and Rice. After they get there, they embrace the sentiments of the Baptist. And they're told by the Baptist there, we're glad you're here. We're glad you believe like we do. You can't stay. You've got to go. Well, they're there in the East India Company. England is allowing them to be there. You Americans can't stay. You'll be viewed as spies. And uh, the East India Company finally told them, either you leave or we'll put you in chains and take you to England. You'll be thrown into the dungeon. And so they left. The two of them, their families, boarded ship. They went to an island off of the coast of India. They stayed there until they determined what they were going to do. Luther Rice, in the meanwhile, he's writing letters. He writes one to the American Board of Foreign Missions telling them, we're Baptist. We're going to have to resign. He writes one to Thomas Baldwin, the Baptist preacher in Boston, who was one of the leaders among the Baptists then, telling him, we're, we've become Baptist, and we want the Baptists to support us and keep us on the mission field. So between the two of them, Judson decides to stay. He will eventually make it to Burma. And you know all about his life and his work. Rice is the one who said, I will return to America. I'll give the report to the Congregationalists and I'll raise support from the Baptists to keep us on the field. And he did. He returned to America. He did what he was, said he was going to do. The Congregationalists had already dropped them having received his correspondence, and the Baptist, the Baptist embraced them. Luther Rice meets with Thomas Baldwin. He meets with others in the north and Richard Furman and some in the south. And in 1814, in May of that year, Luther Rice had gathered the Baptist. The Triennial Convention is formed every three years they're going to meet and discuss missions, support of missions. It was a brand new effort. Probably wasn't done the most scriptural way, the way that you do missions now. But they were making an effort to support missions and to get the missionaries on the field, to keep Judson there. Now, Rice never returned to Asia. God used him here in America. He would travel all around the United States. He'd visit the Baptist churches and he would raise support to keep Judson on the field and to send many other missionaries to labor alongside Judson in Burma and in other places as well. Our text in Luke 6 verse 38, give and it shall be given to you. On one occasion in the South, Luther Rice is attending a preacher's meeting and there is a preacher who is standing in the pulpit and he's preaching about Calvinism. And he said, all oh, the truths that are so hard to be understood, uh, like predestination and uh, the limited atonement and uh, foreknowledge, adoption, all of that, he extolled those things in light of Calvinism. Luther Rice was an ex-preacher. And he said, with respect to my brother, those are not things that are difficult. Those are not things that are hard to be understood. He said, you want to know what's the most, the most difficult for a Christian? His text was Luke 6 and verse 38, give. That's what's most difficult for a Christian. Give, and it shall be given unto you. 
Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Luther, I said, that's the most difficult thing for most Christians to do. And in many ways, he was right about that. He gave his life to raising support for missions. In the process, he founded Columbian College in Washington, D.C., it's known as George Washington University today. Still in existence. It's not used for the same purpose. It's not used for training men for the ministry, but it was then. And God blessed those efforts. He founded what is today the oldest continually, continually published uh, missions periodical, the Columbian Star. Uh, today it's known as the Christian Index and it's published in the state of Georgia. God used him to do that. He wrote a six volume set of books called The Latter Day Luminary. And uh, it's a set like no other. It's not in print. It's not one of those set of books that you put in print, but it had missionary intelligence from all around the world. Luther Rice would receive correspondence from missionaries and he'd publish those letters. He would receive uh, information from pastors telling about the work of missions that was going on near them and through their churches and telling about the need for missions. The Latter-day Luminary is what he called it and uh, they're very rare. The Preservation Society has a set of those in the archives and you're welcome to come and visit us and see those and anything else that you'd like to see. But Luther Rice was doing all of this for the cause of missions. It is said of... Luther Rice said he labored alone. He had no family. He experienced many trials, many setbacks, reproach from those without and from those within. His own brethren would turn on him and in 1822, that's what caused the split over missions in the United States of America. And it's not as prominent in the North, but in the South, you often can, can see a, a missionary Baptist church on one side of the street and uh, a primitive Baptist church by the same name on the opposite side of the street. There was never any Baptist church known as a primitive Baptist church before the 1820s. The split happened over missions. The primitive said, we, we're not going to be involved in missions. We don't want to be involved with mission boards. We don't want to, to support seminaries. We don't want to distribute any religious literature other than the Bible. And that's the reason why most of those churches are dead and only the building is left today because preaching the gospel is what the Lord would have us to do. It's the life of the church and that's how new people come into the church as members. They believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him in believers baptism. Luther Rice understood that he was willing to endure all of those things for the furtherance of the gospel. Later in life, Luther Rice received a letter from Adoniram Judson. Judson said to Rice that he wished he could come to America and see the scenes of his labors in places like Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Boston. And he said, I wish that you could come to Burma and see what's happening here. He said, I wish that you could visit my home. And I wish that you could visit my office. It was his Zayat, the place like a gazebo that's built all over Burma. The place where people would turn in out of the sun and the rain just to get a little rest. And Judson operated a number of those where people would come in and he'd witness to them. And he said, I'm writing this letter on the little desk that used to be our property. It's the only thing, they had their property in common when they made it there to India. He said, it's the only piece of property that we held in common that's still in existence. He said, I'm writing you this letter on that desk. He said, it would be good if I could visit you and if you could visit me. But Judson understood the importance of what Rice was doing. And he said this, one day, in heaven. He said, I want you 
to meet my church. People to whom I have preached the gospel and have become Christians and Baptists. He said, and I want them to meet you, the great benefactor for them. Though they heard about you, they won't be able to meet you until heaven. And I'll say this is the man whom God used to get the gospel preached to you. That meeting has already taken place. And saints, be encouraged. You tell somebody about Jesus. People who have been saved, been a part of this church, and they've been called home, or they've been moved along. There's a reunion day. We'll all be together, and it'll be good, and it'll be for eternity. Ours is to labor where he places us until he calls us home. Luther Rice died in South Carolina September the 25th, 1836. He was called a burning and a shining light. It is said that he was rarely excelled in the pulpit. He thought of himself as a poor sacrifice for the cause of missions. He was called by others a man of prayer. He declined any acknowledgement from mankind over what he had accomplished. He said, all glory goes to God. They placed a nice monument over his grave there in South Carolina. Many tributes have come into him over the years. And it's hard to say. We think of Adoniram Judson and say, what a wonderful job God used him to do there in Burma. And all those many people who believed on the Lord. Judson had over 30 fellow laborers at various times while he was there in Burma and others who outlived him and would follow him. All of them were there with the support that Luther Rice raised for them to go to the mission field. He never made it back. But so many others were able to go all around the world, sent out by the Baptists because of a man like Luther Rice. We all have different labors that we do. God uses them. I know that at times you meet and assemble portions of scriptures. I know that you also go door to door. You tell people about Jesus. You invite them to church and to special things like the vacation Bible school. Don't ever think that your labor is unnecessary. It is necessary. Sometimes you might get the feeling like you're underappreciated. You'll never feel that way when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Sometimes you think it might be easier to let others labor. But I encourage you, saints, through the scripture, through the stories of our Baptist heritage, to labor on for Jesus. Serve him with all your heart. Serve him with your zeal. Do what you can until the Lord calls you home because you will be rewarded and we'll be able to rest in that day. Preacher, you come. Let's all stand together. Trust you, got a blessing hearing about someone who totally gave his life to the Lord. That's what really God expects all of us to do, is to give our lives to him. And uh, maybe through that testimony, maybe the Lord spoke to your heart about something. We'll have the invitation as the organ plays. And if you have a need this, this, this afternoon, now's the time you come.
Heavenly Father, thank you for a good day that we've had here together at church. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to celebrate the 4th of July weekend. And uh, God, we, we pray that you'd help us to appreciate not only the liberty and the freedom that we have in this country, but most of all, the liberty and the freedom that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Father, we pray that you would, you would watch over us as we go. Help us to be a witness. Help us to be a testimony. Uh, just like what we've heard today, help us, Lord, to be a witness and a testimony everywhere we go. May people see Jesus Christ in us. And we'll be careful to thank you and praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. All God's people said.